Hello everybody and welcome to another A-Level Chemistry exam question walkthrough. This time we're focusing on the Arrhenius equation and I'll take a look at two calculation focused questions and then we'll have a look at a graph plotting and activation energy calculating question using the gradient of that negative correlation. And in this video I'll be showing you all the thinking behind the question in blue and the answers that are going to actually get you the marks will be written in green. If you'd like to have a go at the question yourself first and then watch my video and mark your question as you watch it, then the question is available to download in the description. In this video, we're going to take a look at three questions to do with the Arrhenius equation, two that are just calculations based and one looking at the Arrhenius equation's graphs. What they all have in common is they require you to use the natural log button of your calculator, either straight up just pressing the LN button or doing the second function, which gives us the inverse of the natural log, which is e to the power of. And all of this quite complicated maths is based around the Arrhenius equation, which is shown here. And the Arrhenius equation allows you to calculate k, which is the rate constant. And that's the same rate constant that you get from the rate equation, where you have, for instance, rate equals k multiplied by the concentration of a to the power of x, and then b to the power of y, for instance. And so it's the same constant. And yet what the rate equation shows you is how the rate constant depends on concentrations. It doesn't include any of those other things that affect the rate of a chemical reaction that we know from collision theory, whereas the Arrhenius equation does have those other values in it. For instance, at the top here we've got temperature, so we know that temperature affects the rate of reaction, and temperature gives us a bigger value of K when temperature increases. And the activation energy, we know if we use a catalyst, activation energy lowers and that gives us a bigger value of K because it's a faster reaction. And then we've got the Arrhenius constant at the beginning and that is for things such as surface area, anything really that increases the collision frequency without affecting one of those other quantities that I've already mentioned. And so in this question, we are asked to calculate A. And so what we have to do is we have to, first of all, rearrange the Arrhenius equation to make A the subject of this equation. And so what we have to do is we have to divide both sides by e to the power of minus activation energy over RT. And then we substitute our values in. And so we know that the rate constant, we've been given that already, 3.46 times 10 to the minus 8, Activation energy is 96.2 kilojoules per mole. Now that actually needs to be in joules, and so we have to multiply that by a thousand. And then R is in joules per kelvin per mole. That's our clue that the activation energy needs to be in joules, because the gas constant is also in joules. And of course, temperature needs to be in Kelvin, so 25 degrees C is 298 Kelvin. So once we've substituted all those values in, we plug those numbers into the calculator, and when you are working out a value for e to the minus, you have to make sure that you understand how your calculator works here. Typically, you press the second function and then the natural log button, and then brackets negative the activation energy divided by R times by T, close brackets. That's the typical way that you'd be using your calculator if you're not particularly confident with that second function and the natural log. And so we get a value here of 2.57 times 10 to the 9. And that value for the Arrhenius constant can really, really vary. So unfortunately, you can't really anticipate what that value is going to be. What we do know is that any value that has been processed in terms of a log or an inverse log, you can't actually have any units for those outcomes. And so what that means is the units of A are always going to be the same as the units of the rate constant, which we've been given in the question up here, seconds to the minus one. And so to repeat, the units of E to the minus EA over RT, that can never have any units. And so the units of K are always the same as the units of A. Now, if you're more confident with your maths and you prefer to approach it like this, what you can do is you can take natural logs of both sides of the expression. And so then the Arrhenius equation becomes LNK equals LNA minus EA over RT. 
and then you rearrange that to make ln a the subject, you get ln k plus ea over rt. And then once you've started crunching those numbers, what you get is the natural log of a is negative 17.179 plus 38.847, which then comes out at 21.667. And then when you just do the inverse of that, you get a is equal to 2.57 times 10 to the 9 again, and still seconds to the minus 1. So it doesn't really matter which of those methods you use at all, it's just a personal preference and a confidence with an approach that you want to learn. Obviously, if you forget some of those conversions of the units that I mentioned earlier, you will still get method marks, and you're most likely to get three out of the four for that one mistake of not remembering the conversions. In this second question, it's really common for an Arrhenius equation question to begin by showing you the rate constant k in an, a different setting. So for instance here, we've got a rate equals k, so a classic rate equation approach. And so you've been given some data about what the values are for those concentrations and what the rate of reaction actually is, 3.1 times 10 to the minus 3. And so you're being asked to calculate the rate constant at this temperature, so 25 degrees C, but actually the temperature is not significant. And so the first thing that we have to do is we have to rearrange the rate equation to make K the subject. So that is dividing both sides by the concentration of C times D. And so we get K is equal to the rate divided by the concentration of C times D. And so once we substitute those values in that we were given in the expression above, we then run those numbers through the calculator and we get 2.8 times 10 to the minus two. I recommend a minimum of two significant figures here and two significant figures is really what's appropriate because the data in the question has been given to two significant figures as well. Although since they haven't specified, they're not going to be too fussy. The units of the rate constant, we have to calculate those by taking the units of the rate, moles per decimeter cubed per second, and dividing that by concentrations units times concentrations units, so moles per decimeter cubed times moles per decimeter cubed. And so one of those moles cancels on the top and the bottom, one of the dm minus three cancels on the top and the bottom, and so we're left with seconds to the minus one over moles per decimeter cubed. And then we have to bring all of those units from the bottom up to the top. So moles on the bottom becomes moles minus 1 when we bring it up to the top of the line. And then dm minus 3 becomes dm to the 3. And so we're left with mole minus 1, dm3, seconds to the minus 1. Then we move into the Arrhenius equation aspects of this question. And you can see they've already taken natural logs of the Arrhenius expression. And so we've got the ln k is equal to minus ea over rt plus natural log of a. And so we've been asked to use this equation to combine with our rate constant that we calculated in a to work out a value for the activation energy for this reaction at 25 degrees C. And so first of all, I, I recommend substituting the values in. So we've got our answer for K from it, the first question. So we've got natural log of our answer from question A is equal to negative of our activation energy divided by R, 8.31, times by 298, plus the natural log of A. Now, this is a really common mistake I've seen students make. The natural log of A has actually already been given to us, and it's equal to 16.9. So we're not substituting in 16.9 and then taking the natural log of it. It is just 16.9 taking the place of L and A in that expression. So when we rearrange that, we get the activation energy is equal to RT times by LNK minus LNA, and ultimately, we get an activation energy of 50,716 joules per mole. And they've asked us this time to report it in kilojoules per mole. So we, of course, need to divide that by 1,000. And so we get 50.7 kilojoules per mole. And in a question like this, they're likely to accept 51 kilojoules per mole because they haven't asked us for a particular degree of precision to be reported. This final question to do with the Arrhenius equation is where we deal with the Arrhenius equation being expressed in the form y equals mx plus c, and we're going to be asked to draw a graph using these data that are going to be presented in the table, and we're going to be asked to calculate one of the features of the Arrhenius equation using our graph, typically activation energy, and that's what it turns out to be in this final question. 
And so we're presented with some data. We've got different values for the rate constant here on the left hand side of the table and you can see there's a series of annoying bits of standard form, very small numbers, and that's probably one of the extra fiddly bits to do with this type of question. The numbers get really small, and we're looking at how the rate constant changes with different temperatures. You can see the temperature, when it's bigger, leads to a far bigger rate constant, and that's expressed here in this table. And so we're given a series of commands and the, overall this is an eight mark question and so they're asking us to complete the table by calculating the values for ln k and 1 over t and so that's likely to be one mark for each correct column so doing all of this column and all of this column will get you one mark and then they're asking us to plot a graph of the natural log of k against 1 over t and then we're using the graph to work out a value for activation energy, showing all of our workings at all times in order to guarantee full marks. And they've reminded us about the gas constant here. And so the first thing to do is to work out the values from the table. This is simply a case of pressing the natural log button on your calculator and inserting the value of k, including the standard form, in each of these cases. And so for the first one, for instance, you type in natural log of 6.13 times 10 to the minus 5, and you get minus 9.7. And then similarly, you do the exact same process all the way down the table, and here are the numbers that you get. And then temperature, this is actually an even easier mark. This is an, almost a free mark. You need to type in one and then divided by whatever the temperature is in Kelvin on the left-hand side. And so one over 700 is 1.43 times 10 to the minus three. And performing the same function, we end up with these numbers in our table. One mark for each of those two columns, two of our eight marks secured. And then the second part of this question asked us to plot a graph using the data. And I said it was in the form of y equals mx plus c. And so I've rewritten the equation as we were given it in the question. And so I said it was in the, in the form y equals mx plus c. And that means that the natural log of k is y and the natural log of a is c. That's nice and easy. But the bit in the middle, the mx part, is unclear. And what we've got is we've got the m is negative activation energy over r and the x is 1 over t. And so what we've got then is we're going to plot a graph of the natural log of k on the y axis and 1 over t is going to be on the x axis. And so we're going to put our data into the grid in following that pattern. And when you're plotting your values, we need to be mindful of the fact that the values of ln k are negative and we're going, therefore, the numbers are going to get bigger as we go down in terms of their magnitude, but they're obviously getting smaller. So minus 9.7 is the smallest number we're plotting. So I suggest we go down to minus 10 and we're starting at minus 4.8 is our smallest number. But if we just follow the major grid lines and we go down in ones as we work our way up, this is going to be perfectly adequate for our space. Our plotted points need to take up at least half of the paper. So in terms of the y-axis, we're going to be maybe using about from here, that's about 9.7, all the way up to 4.8, which is about here. So we're not using the top line and a bit in terms of major grid lines, but we're definitely using more than half of our y-axis. Now, in terms of writing your labels on your x-axis, you can use this top line here, which is strictly speaking where the value should go because this is in the bottom right quadrant of in terms of the x and y coordinates. But most people seem to like to write the numbers down here. I've put it in in both positions, just so you can see it could go in either position. And that's absolutely fine in terms of clarity of how you're going to plot your graph. And now I've plotted my values on the axes. You can see that what I've done is I've gone up in 0 0.05 intervals along my x-axis. And that's because my biggest value that I'm going to be plotting is 1.43 times 10 to the minus 3. And the smallest value I'm going to be plotting is 1.26 times 10 to the minus 3. And that's going to be somewhere along here. And so this, again, is going to be using approximately four-fifths of my x-axis. And so my plotted points are going to be falling in this region, which is going to be significantly more than half of my axes being used. 
What you'll also notice about my x-axis is I was a bit lazy in terms of what I wrote down in terms of this section. And what I did was I just said that what I'm plotting on my x-axis is 1 over t multiplied by 10 to the power of 3. And what that means is that these numbers that I'm plotting are actually a thousand times bigger than the real numbers. There's no reason why you have to do it like this. You could totally easily actually plot the real numbers. I just thought it would be a little bit of a squeeze. Seeing all of that standard form on the x-axis, I just went for the slightly more convenient and perhaps neater looking approach of taking the standard form out and putting it into the label for the actual axis itself. But there's no reason why you couldn't do this all the way along your x-axis. Your choice, of course. And now we've done this, it's just a case of plotting the points, which is frankly the easy part once you've worked out your scale and your axes for the Arrhenius equation. The plotting the points is straightforward. Here we are with the points plotted. And then it's just a case of working out the best line of uh, best fit to use. Normally they're quite generous here. And in fact, I would advise that if you actually don't have a clear line of best fit, just check your points that you've plotted because it's very rare for them to give you a mean line of best fit. And there might be the occasional anomaly, but that isn't common. And so you should have a very nice, clear, straight line going diagonally down from top left to bottom right for your plotted points. It's always going to be a negative gradient, and that's because the gradient, remember, is negative activation energy over R. And since activation energy is just an amount of energy, activation energy is always going to be positive, so your gradient must always therefore be negative because it's negative activation energy divided by the gas constant. And so this is the graph plotted, two marks here, one mark for plotting all of the points accurately and one for the correct line of best fit. And so now comes the calculation of the gradient and so we need to use our graph to calculate the gradient I would suggest that we already have a triangle ready for us to work out the gradient of. And so you can see that if we use the entirety of the graph as being a triangle, because I deliberately drew my best fit line to actually hit the x-axis and the y-axis, although it looks like I just missed up at the top. And so you can see that the x-axis starts at 1.2 and finishes at 1.44 at this point here. So the change in x is 0 0.24. Remember these values are actually times 10 to the minus 3. So it's actually 0 0.24 times 10 to the minus 3 is our change in x. And the y-axis is all the way down to the bottom. So that's minus 10 at the bottom here. And so up at the top it is minus 3.2. And so the change in y is minus 6.8 because that's the difference between those two numbers because it's got smaller by 6.8. And so the gradient is minus 6.8 divided by 0.24 times 10 to the minus 3, which gets us an answer that will be different for everybody because it will depend on your actual gradient. My answer is 28,333 as my value for my gradient. And so remember that that is negative activation energy over R. So we now need to rearrange that to find the activation energy. So first of all, our gradient was minus 28,333. That's minus activation energy over R. And so we can just get rid of the negatives, divide both sides by minus one. And so then we need to multiply our gradient by 8.31 for R or 8.314, as I think we were given in the question. And that gives us our activation energy of 235,563 joules per mole. Now they have asked for this to be in kilojoules per mole, that's really standard for us to need that. And so whenever you've done an activation energy graph, you need to then divide that by a thousand and I get 235.6 kilojoules per mole and they asked us to give it to three significant figures, so that is going to be 236 to three significant figures. Okay, that's the end of this question. That's the end of the video. I hope it was useful. I'll see you again soon.